It is my great pleasure on behalf of the Center for Latin American Studies and the School for Environment and Natural Resources to welcome Professor Annette, and she gave me permission to murder her last name because I cannot pronounce it in the proper pronunciation. So I get to say Annette de Moray. De Mara? Is that is, was that the way it was supposed to be? De Mara? Oh yay! Did it. Okay. She's an associate professor of international studies at the University of Regina in Canada. She received a PhD in geography from the University of Calgary and a master's in gender and development from the University of Sussex. She's worked since 1986 in international development, focusing on gender analysis of rural and agricultural development. For 10 years, she worked for Oxfam Canada as project coordinator of the Oxfam Global Agricultural Project. She also worked with La Via Campesina, providing technical support in program and policy development since its inception in 1993. Professor de Mara has over 25 years of experience in facilitating the development of policy alternatives among farm, peasant, and rural women's organizations in a wide variety of countries, including Nicaragua, Mexico, Honduras, Bolivia, Guatemala, India, and Canada. Oh, and you said Egypt as well. Um, she also has conducted research on farm organizations' responses to changes in agricultural economies and the strategies that have been adopted to improve the quality of life in rural areas. Her current research focuses on food sovereignty in Mexico, Spain, and Canada, and she continues to do research with La Via Campesina. She has um, uh, authored or co-authored three books as well as numerous journal articles and book chapters, two of which um, I hope you've had an opportunity to read before coming here to the talk. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Nemera, who will be talking about La Via Campesina. The title of the talk is We Will Not Be Disappeared, La Via Campesina and the Power of Imagination. Help me welcome Dr. Nemera. First thing I want to do is to uh, thank you very much for actually inviting me to give this talk on the Via Campesina. And what I'd like to do today is actually discuss uh, some of the main strategies that the Via Campesina has used in their efforts to build alternatives to the very, very powerful forces of economic globalization. And I'm going to start with a couple of anecdotes. Uh, first of all, can you hear me in the back? OK. Um, I'm going to start with a couple of anecdotes which will then lead me to explain the roots of the movement as well as some of the ways uh, that it is working uh, and the impact that the Via Campesina is having. I'm not going to talk, I'm, not, I'm going to try not to talk in detail about food sovereignty because I, I know that uh, Eric Holt Jimenez was here a, a couple of months ago, maybe a couple of weeks ago, uh, and that's what he talked about. Uh, but I have to stress that it's impossible to talk about the Via Campesina and not talk about food sovereignty also, because it is so much of what the Via Campesina is really all about. So, the first anecdote. It, it involves a family gathering that took place about four years ago. It was a huge family reunion, and I was visiting with a cousin um, whom I had not seen for at least a decade. And in response to her question about what I had been doing with my life, uh, I told her that my very first book had just been published. She asked me the title, and uh, I told her uh, the title was The Via Campesina, Globalization and the Power of Peasants. And she looked at me quite, she didn't know how to respond, essentially. And, but looked very thoughtful, and you know, she was contemplating what I had just told her, and she says, the power of pheasants. <laughs> How interesting. <laughs> and, you know, of course, we might not be that surprised that, um, you know, since peasants really have not been part of the everyday language of Canadians, um, that she, you know, it isn't surprising that she was looking for something more familiar to grab onto, like pheasants. Um, but even academics, uh, working in the countries uh, in the global south 
denied the existence of peasants, which brings me to the second anecdote. In 1998, uh, when I was looking for an appropriate graduate school, I ran into an anthropologist uh, who, after hearing about my intent to study the formation and functioning of an international peasant movement, she looked at me quite perturbed, actually, and said, but peasants no longer exist. And then she proceeded, it proceeded to give me this whole long list of academic sources proving just that, that peasants no longer exist. Well, interesting, I thought, because I, by that time, I had spent uh, about 10 years with people, working with people around the world, people who called themselves peasants. Over the years, I had been hearing uh, comments from farm leaders uh, similar to the, the one made by uh, Mar Marcelo Carrion Mundo from uh, Mexico, who said to me, a campesino, a peasant, comes from the countryside. There have always been campesinos. What did not exist before were investors, industrialists, political parties, etc. Campesinos have always existed and they will never be abolished. In fact, far from being abolished, peasants and small-scale farmers organized in La Via Campesina have actually been taking center stage in redefining agriculture and redefining food systems at the local level, at the national and international levels. Since the beginning of the Uruguay round of the GATT, representatives of rural organizations from the north and south organized in the Via Campesina those representatives have walked together in the streets of Geneva, Paris, Seattle, Washington, Quebec City, Rome, Bangalore, and Porto Alegre, among other places. Whenever and wherever the World Bank or the World Trade Organization meet to discuss agricultural issues, the Via Campesina is there. It is also there La Via Campesina is also there in local communities when peasants and farm families in locales as diverse as Honduras, Mexico, Brazil, uh, Guatemala, Indonesia, Europe, and Canada are resisting the spread of genetically modified organisms or they're being effect, uh, evicted from their lands to facilitate the um, urban sprawl or the development of golf courses, intensive shrimp farms, large pig barns, or eucalyptus plantations. For many onlookers, you know, for many people watching, uh, this level of activity is very surprising because for over 100 years, people who thought that they knew what was going on in the countryside around the world, they, those people have predicted the disappearance of the peasantry. Surely, all of those peasants by now should have been disappeared. They should all be gone. But instead, the Via Campesina integrated peasants and small-scale farmers from around the world, and those peasants are turning up everywhere. And they're really a, a, a very loud and troublesome voice amid all of those people who are extolling the praises of globalization. And wearing these green, um, uh, dark green caps and uh, uh, panuelos, kind of kerchiefs, white t-shirts, and waving green flags that has a really brightly colored uh, logo, uh, and, and very energetically chanting logans, uh, log slogans, the Via Campesina has become an increasingly visible actor and very vocal voice of radical opposition against the globalization of a particular model of agriculture. And this resistance actually took a, a, a very extreme turn in September uh, 2003 with the tragic death of the Korean farm leader, Compañero Lee, as he is called in the Via Campesina, who along with 120 Koreans had joined the Via Campesina delegation in Cancun at the, at the, um, the um, I think it was the fifth uh, uh, ministerial meeting of the, the WTO. And they were there to essentially demand that the uh, WTO get out of agriculture. And wearing a sign call, uh, with a uh, saying, WTO kills farmers, Compañero Lee 
walked up to the high wire fence that had been built to protect the negotiators, the trade negotiators, from the protesters, and he stabbed himself to death. Now, this, this act of self-immolation was Lee's ultimate act of protest, an act that shocked Mexico and all those who had gathered in Cancun uh, to protest uh, the fifth ministerial meeting of the WTO. And this ultimate and tragic act of resistance, in fact, actually symbolized what La Vieja Cina had been saying all along. Liberalization of agriculture is a war on peasants. It decimates rural communities and it destroys uh, peasant families, rural families, farming families. Lee's desperate cry for change subsequently helped actually to strengthen the Via Campesina. And the Via Campesina now is actually considered by many as being the world's most politically significant transnational agrarian movement. It represents 148 organizations of peasants, small farmers, rural women, indigenous communities, and farm workers from 69 countries, 69 countries based in Asia, Africa, Europe, uh, and the Americas. So let's just step back and try to maybe get a better understanding of why and how the Via Campesina was formed. Well, first of all, it's important to note that this movement emerged in a particular political, economic, and social context. And it was a context that was undermining the ability of peasants and small-scale farmers around the world to maintain control over lands, to maintain control over territory, over seeds and water, all resources that are absolutely necessary to produce food. The Via Campesina formed, uh, was formally constituted uh, in 1993 during a, an international conference that was held in Mons, Belgium. And the conference was held just prior to the signing of the Uruguay round of the GATT. Now this round of GATT was critical for farmers because it was the first time that it, the agreement included agriculture uh, and food in its negotiations. Now the 45 farm leaders that met uh, at Mons clearly understood that the GATT, the final act of the GATT, along with the creation of a new organization, the WTO, represented a profound shift away from the more controlled national economies to an almost exclusively market-driven global economy. So at that conference in Mons, farm leaders also clearly understood that the further entrenchment of neoliberalism would spur national governments to, con to continue to dismantle the agrarian structures and also the kinds of programs that peasants and small-scale farmers had fought for so long to put in place. These were the structures and programs that has, had been put in place to help ensure uh, production for domestic consumption and also uh, these programs and mechanisms helped ensure national food security. So confronting national and global forces aimed at driving them off the land, the farm leaders who met in Mons engaged in a very sophisticated collective analysis in search of, all, of, of an, an, an alternative model to this brutal uh, globalization that was creating greater displacement, impoverishment, and marginalization in the countryside. They insisted that small-scale farmers and peasants had to be at the center of developing alternative food and agriculture policies. Now, I want to stress that this common ground that the, and, and the kind of agreement that you saw coming out of the Mons uh, conference did not happen by magic. It did not happen spontaneously. Instead, what we need to do is understand the historical roots of the Via Campesina and understand that they actually go back, they stretch back to uh, a much earlier time. Throughout the 1980s, rural organizations in the North and South had been actually engaged in North, South, South, South uh, organizational exchanges. And through those exchanges, farm leaders concentrated on learning what was going on in each other's countries. 
as a result of this, the kind of structural adjustment programs that had been imposed by the international uh, organizations like the uh, IMF and the World Bank. They also wanted to know well, what was happening in, those in each other's country as a result of regional trade agreements. They sought to understand how national governments were altering, were changing, were dismantling all of those structures and mechanisms that I mentioned just earlier on. They wanted to know how farming peoples were organizing themselves. What kinds of strategies were they using? Uh, what kind of resistance strategies were they using? What, uh, what issues were they facing? And really important, what kinds of alternatives were farm organizations in different parts of the world putting in place? These exchanges, you know, through these exchanges, farm leaders actually discovered that they shared a lot of common ground everywhere. The industrialization and liberalization of agriculture was leading to a key and acute agricultural crisis that was caused by the restructuring of agriculture. They saw that um, the acute crisis in agriculture was also caused by and, and actually contributing to a further destruction of biodiversity, uh, further degradation of the environment, uh, increased disparity, and certainly greater impoverishment in the countryside. It was also leading to the consolidation and concentration of agro-business corporations. And increasingly, as a result of that, peasants and small-scale farmers were being driven off the land. Now, it was through these exchanges, that, which lasted anywhere from you know, two weeks to six weeks, that farm leaders helped close the north-south divide that is actually quite common in, in some international uh, movements. Now, I just want to give you um, a couple of examples of what these um, exchanges meant uh, for the farmers involved. Um, and I'm just quoting these. These are from the book, The, the Via Campesina, Globalization and the Power of Peasants. Um, and the first one is a comment made by a Mexican uh, peasant leader, okay? And he says, uh, we also had the opportunity to host Canadian farmers. They went to Guanajuato and were shocked to see how small our land holdings are, how backward our technology is, the differences in cost and production of production, and how high our interest rates are. But in the end, we faced the same transnational strategy, a strategy of capital accumulation with a devastating con consequence on people's economy. Our enemy is the same. The strategies may be different, but as farmers, our objective is the same give to society adequate and healthy food. And another comment by uh, a member of the National Farmers Union in Canada, which is the National Farmers Union in Canada is quite different than the National Farmers Union here in the United States. I just thought I'd point that out. Um, so this is a, a leader of the uh, National Farmers Union in Canada, and he's talking about um, an exchange that they had uh, years ago in, um, in China. The thing that maybe tied you together, or the commonality of it, was the role of the multinational uh, corporations in all of these areas. Being able to bring back the experiences and have people understand the role of multinationals was an important aspect of those exchanges because it didn't matter whether you were a peasant or whether you had a 1,600 acre farm. The multinationals had their influence in terms of your business. And now, of course, the encroachment of multinationals in terms of farmers is getting closer to home all the time. Um, the last comment I want to quote from is from a Caribbean farmer who came up to, uh, to Saskatchewan and was there for six weeks. And as a result of his time in Saskatchewan, he said, things are not all rosy up here. When I first arrived, I saw all the, big far all the big machinery and thought the farmers here must be very rich. But that's not the case. There are a lot of poor farmers in Canada. Everywhere it's the same thing. It is a struggle just to survive. The big buyers make all the money and they leave us the scraps. So these exchanges were critical to building the, the very, very strong ties of understanding ties of trust, 
and friendship and solidarity, all essential ingredients to the formation, to the consolidation of a transnational peasant movement. And by the time farmers arrived to Mons, Belgium, to formally constitute the Via Campesina, they were quick to identify the threat farming families everywhere faced. Their livelihoods, their ways of life, indeed their very mode of existence were all at stake. Now, um, farming families responded then to the spread of this corporate, this increasingly corporate and neo neoliberal model of agriculture by establishing some common ground, some commonalities, and working in solidarity to form the Via Campesina, an international uh, peasant movement. And the Via Campesina argues that neoliberal policies are often sustained by human rights abuses and increased violence in the countryside, and that violence and human rights uh, abuses are actually geared specifically to intim intimidate peasants. While economic liberalization poses a real danger to national food security and threatens the livelihood and very survival of peasant families. And as a result of all of that, then, peasants and small scale farmers and their families in, the, in both the north and south are being disappeared and rural communities are decimated. But as the Via Campesina so defiantly stated in its second international conference that was held in Tascala, Mexico in 1996, we will not be disappeared. We will not be intimidated. These words actually were spoken primarily uh, in response to the massacre of 16 members of the MST, the Movimento Centera, uh, that occurred on the eve of La Via Campesina's uh, second international conference. In Brazil, on April 17th, in a very small city of El Dorado dos Carajas, in the northern state of Para, the military police had opened fire on a group of demonstrators who were demanding access to land. 19 of the people, uh, of the peasants were killed, with another 30 uh, being wounded. La Via Campesina responded by declaring April 17th the International Day of Peasant Struggle. And every year now, um, on April 17th, peasants and farmers around the world joined, actually, by an increasing number of urban-based uh, social movements uh, and environmentalists and uh, human rights activists. On April 17th, all those people now hit the streets and they make the news. In great numbers, they take to the streets, they engage in land oc occupations and other direct actions. They fill auditoriums and local halls. They organize public meetings, teachings and press conferences. And, holding, and they hold briefings with government officials also. These efforts are geared to highlight the human rights abuses in the countryside and to focus the world's attention on the daily struggles of peasants around the world. Now, armed with this strong conviction in their right to continue to make a living by growing food in the countryside, La Via Campesina members are fighting for the very right to exist. Now, this isn't just a struggle for survival. It is a struggle to protect not only their communities and cultures, but also their right to produce food in their own territory and to produce that food in culturally appropriate ways for domestic consumption for human beings through what it calls food sovereignty. Now, just in a nutshell, food sovereignty of peoples and nations to control their own food and agricultural systems, including their own markets, production modes, food cultures, and environments. And importantly, food sovereignty is absolutely critical. Uh, it's a prerequisite to the human right uh, to food and food security. Now this goal, uh, the goal of the Via Campesina then is to effect change in the countryside by implementing food sovereignty. It believes that this can only occur when local communities actually gain more uh, access to and control over local resources, productive resources, and 
uh, also they have to gain more social and political power. Now this rootedness is being used both to imagine and to present an alternative present and also a future. The implications of this goal of, of essentially transforming the, agri the, the agricultural systems that we currently have are pretty straightforward. Since local communities are deeply affected by outside forces, the Via Campesina strategy then is to help local and national organizations by concentrating on two main things. Building solidarity and unity among a great, great diversity of organizations that are located in 69 countries. And secondly, creating spaces for these organizations to participate in international deliberations on food and agriculture. And the Via Campesina has succeeded in bringing together this great diversity of organizations from the North and South. And it has done so around uh, the food sovereignty mission, uh, vision. Rafael Alegria, a peasant leader from Honduras, and he was actually the uh, former operational secretariat of the Via Campesina, explains it like this. He says, I think that what really unites us is a fundamental commitment to humanism, because the antithesis of this is individualism and materialism. The common problems of land, production, technology, markets, ideological formation, training, poverty, all of these we have in common. But what also unites us are great aspirations. We are all convinced that the current structures of economic, political, and social power are unjust and exclusionary. What unites us is a spirit of transformation and struggle to change these structures all over the world. We aspire to a better world, a more just world, a more humane world, a world where real equality and social justice exist. These aspirations and solidarity in rural struggles keep us united in the Via Campesina. So how does the Via Campesina actually succeed in building this unity that Rafael Alegria is so proud of, actually, and, and that he emphasizes. Well, this unity is certainly part of the results, in part, results from the, um, the exchanges that I just mentioned. But, and, and certainly the exchanges continue to be a very important tool that the Via Campesina uses, uh, because they, the exchanges have led to the successful building of, of important linkages and long-standing linkages among the, the farm organizations. But the Via Campesina also works hard at strength, strengthening the representation and participation of women uh, at all levels of the movement. And that's one of the articles that, that you might have read um, before this talk uh, certainly addressed that point. Um, it, it, it analyzed how the Via Campesina actually has managed to certainly increase the presence uh, representation and participation of women in the agriculture uh, sector and within the movement. But it's doing the same thing with youth. Um, the movement also creates spaces for debate with the ultimate goal of articulating joint positions and policies, so a coming together of, of uh, visions uh, and also strategies. Now these spaces often involve uh, engaging in collective direct action. The Via Campesina focuses its work on uh, eight key issues of concern to its membership everywhere. And these issues are food sovereignty and trade, one of the mo one of, you know, a very, very important uh, part of its work. Genuine agrarian reform, human rights, also key, biodiversity and genetic resources, Sustainable peasant agriculture or agroecological farming, migration, internal displacement, and rural workers, and it focuses on uh, working with or including uh, more women and youth uh, in the movement uh, and um, uh, increasing their involvement in developing policies for changes in the agriculture sector. Now for all of these issues, the Via Campesina has um, established an international working commission 
uh, which has representation from each one of the nine regions. Not only does it have you know, one representative from each of the regions, each region actually must send a man and a woman to each one of those uh, commissions. And that was one of the ways, the affirmative action strategy that they used to actually ensure that women uh, were more actively involved in the movement. Now, the ability of an international movement to act effectively depends on the movement's capacity to collectively analyze the current global context. You got to know, you know, you have to know what you're fighting. It depends on its ability to define some very strategic goals and its capacity to elaborate, elaborate some very appropriate uh, strategies and tactics. And importantly, the ability um, of a radical international movement to be effective also depends on its commitment to distribute power among all participants and its ability to develop structures and mechanisms to ensure inclusive democratic decision making within the movement itself. That's in, in order to be an effective radical international movement, that's what you have to do. Now only then can social movements continue to actually represent the interests uh, and the concerns of all of its constituencies. Well, the Via Campesina's aim is to implement food sovereignty, a model of agriculture and food that is based on the principles of social justice, human rights, environmental, uh, uh, environmental sustainability, and certainly respect for cultural diversity. And that means that it involves um, inclusive, equitable, participatory, and democratic decision-making mechanisms and structures. Now, while demanding those things of external bodies, you know, while the Via Campesina demands that the WTO be more democratic, it demands that its you know, national governments, uh, where their members are, are located, be more democratic, the Via, Campesina, the Via Campesina then also must internalize those very demands. That means that the Via Campesina has to demonstrate by example. It has to be uh, democratic. The key policy decision-making body of the La Via Campesina is the international con conference that it holds every four years. And those conferences bring together delegates from all member organizations uh, and all organizations are asked to send three representatives, one man, one woman, and one youth. Now, to date, the Via Campesina has held international conferences in Mons, Mexico, Mons Belgium, uh, Mexico, ba Bangalore, India, uh, Brazil, and Maputo. The last one was in Maputo. The next one it, the, it will hold uh, will be in Indonesia in 2013. Now these gatherings are critical spaces for cultural exchanges, uh, for internal debate, for renewing uh, friendship and solidarity ties, and they're also key moments uh, for when the Via Campesina defines new positions, it defines its policies, and it also comes up with new strategies. What's interesting is that um, prior to and in between the uh, international conferences, all regional, all regions of the Via Campesina, there are nine regions, hold their own regional conferences. And also the 18 member uh, international coordinating committee of the Via Campesina, uh, made up of two representatives, one man and one woman from each of the regions. Well, they meet every six months to coordinate the implementation decisions that are made by the international uh, conference and to deal with any new issues um, that come up uh, in between the international conferences. Now in some ways, I think that the Via Campesina can be understood as a radical democratic project that on the one hand exposes the power dynamics within the current uh, global food system and on the other hand, cultivates new spaces for inclusive debate on a whole new set of different issues related to food and agriculture. And the Via Campesina is contesting these power relations in very public ways. If we remember Rosa Luxemburg's um, famous, famous comment that, and I quote, the most revolutionary thing one can do always is to proclaim loudly what is happening, unquote, 
then La Via Campesina and its concept of food sovereignty are nothing less than deeply revolutionary. So I think that there's some really important lessons to be learned from these you know, two anecdotes and, and the Via Campesina's uh, nearly 20 year history that I've just, just, just barely touched on. First, I think, is the need to recognize that, as some of the social movement literature argues, often when it comes to ideas that actually help change the world, that help you know, really create social change, academics and academia are actually the last to know. Um, now, this is certainly the case with food sovereignty, uh, a concept that was first introduced by, uh, in the international arena some 15 years ago by uh, a movement of peasants and small-scale farmers, people who should have been disappeared a long time ago. Yet, it is only now that some academic institutions have become, to, have actually started to, to talk about food sovereignty. Now, the second important lesson that we might want to learn is that to better understand the Via Campesina's vision, to better understand the potential and the challenges of uh, food sovereignty, we need to look very, very carefully at the social actors involved. Concepts that have real uh, transformatory potential don't appear in a vacuum as disembodied intellectual exercises. Instead, food sovereignty is a deeply, deeply grounded idea. It's a concept, it's a framework that was embodied initially in the very lives of peasants and farmers in the North and the South. And later on, food sovereignty was actually reworked somewhat uh, in interaction with urban-based social movements. Now this embodiment, I think, gives food sovereignty a much more potential to succeed. And it also, of course, makes it a lot more complex. And I think that the Via Campesina clearly demonstrates that the most radical resistance to neoliberal globalization is successfully um, constructed through the meaningful expression of a collective imagination. It seems to me that the movement um, has accomplished this by succeeding in consolidating a collective identity, in succeeded in providing spaces for internal uh, debate and also the, then the collective articulation of a coherent set of demands in the international arena. Uh, it has very systematically been very clear about naming the enemy. Uh, it has been very strategic about when to engage and disengage in negotiation with powerful forces. And it has always engaged in direct action, even when they're in the middle of negotiation. And it has also built some very important alliances with other rural uh, movements and, and uh, urban-based uh, social movements, as well as with some progressive uh, NGOs. Now, in doing this, the Via Campesina experience clearly demonstrates that it embraces a great diversity of struggles occurring around the world. And in order to understand the Via Campesina, we need to then pay attention to the multiplicity of the sites and the um, multifaceted nature of resistance. For example, the NFU's struggles in Saskatchewan will differ considerably from what the Via Campesina's struggles in Indonesia look like. And so that means that we have to really understand the particular nature of struggles in specific locales uh, and countries and to better understand how each, is, each of those struggles are actually shaped by a whole range of factors which involve uh, the actual social, social actors involved, the, um, the, the history, uh, ecology, politics, uh, and also culture. But another really important lesson, and I'll just uh, uh, finish with, with that lesson, um, is that we need to also understand how those various and very diverse uh, struggles are all connected. And, and importantly, how they shape one another. Um, I think I just want to 
end, actually, my last comment, um, by quoting Eduardo Galliano. Um, because I have five minutes? Yes. Okay. Um, okay, I mean, there are many, many, many th other things that we can learn from the Via Campesina's experience, but certainly I think it teaches us that not only have peasants refused to be disappeared, instead what they've done is gifted us uh, a model that they argue can feed the world and cool the planet. And importantly, their food sovereignty model is backed by a number of rights articulated in a new international uh, declaration on peasants' rights, which is currently being discussed by the Human Rights Council. It is largely thanks to the collective imagination and the social and political struggles of the Via Campesina that we are now, today, talking about a radically different model of agriculture, that is, one based on food sovereignty. And this global movement for food sovereignty is growing and gaining power. And I, um, one of the things that the Via Campesina experience, I think, tells us is that um, Eduardo Galeano, a famous Latin American uh, author who's written something like five books, um, stresses that we really need to keep in mind the importance of the right to dream. He, he actually you know, is, is arguing that inter, the international human rights bodies should recognize the hum, the, a human right to dream. And he said that, he makes that argument because he argues that none of the human rights that we have today would have come about had we not been able to have the right to do. And the Via, the Via Campesina, I think, is a real concrete expression of a, an international peasant movement who collectively uh, use their imagination, who collectively dream of another uh, kind of agriculture, and they're actually putting it in place. And it is, as they say, um, a struggle to globalize uh, hope. And I think I'm just going to leave it at that and ask you if you have any questions. Um, the articles that you might have read before coming here uh, or of questions on what I uh, talked about today or any other question that you might have on the Via Campesina. Yeah. Before we begin that, I want to ask, oh. has everyone in my class, we're going to back to this uh, who in my class has not yet signed the sign-up sheet? Okay, a couple in the back. Where is the sign-up sheet? Okay, just hand it down. All right, make sure to give it to me before you leave. Who else has it? All right. So, since um, Dr. Demarat has graciously agreed to answer questions and converse with you, who would like to begin? Yes. Ready? Yeah. Well, I think I think one of the key concrete gains actually is putting it, putting you know uh, putting food sovereignty into the public discourse. I mean, the fact that now, as a result of the food crisis, uh, you know, most of the response to the food crisis, or, or an, an awful lot of it, even the institutional response, now argues that we have to focus on uh, working with small-scale farmers. That, in and of itself, is I I. I would say is a result of the, some of the work that the Via Campesina has done. Now the question is whether or not the Via Campesina will be able to hold those powerful forces to task and make sure that they're actually supporting the right kind of agriculture. Okay, so that's another huge challenge. But, but just that's a big huge accomplishment. The other accomplishment I think is that the fact that when international institutions meet now, um, they actually call on to the Via Campesina. 
I mean, the, you know, when the real plus 20, I guess it is now, is meeting in Brazil in June, uh, the Vietnam Sina has been invited as an official, uh, you know, part of those negotiations, that, that discussion. Uh, so, it's, it's, so it's recognized now as an international force, okay? Um, the, the fact that the Food and Agriculture Organization now has, well, since 1996, has um, established a, an international planning committee, uh, which is its civil, it's, it's, it's the civil society um, arm um, that, that the FAO actually uh, talks to about food sovereignty. Okay, so, so the fact that you actually have the, the, the NF, the, NF, the FAO, um, you know, on a regular basis, uh, consulting with uh, peasants and and farmers and uh, you know other groups too. It's not it's not the the International Planning Committee on Food Sovereignty isn't just uh, made up of Via Campesina, but you know that's where the Via Campesina is also working. Um, the fact that. Um, uh, the fact that uh, I think there's an increasing interest in urban centers. Uh, I mean, people are people are increasingly concerned about the food that they're eating. Are they not? Are you not concerned about the food that you're eating? You know, I, I think that that in part has been the result of some of the work that the Via Campesina has done. Certainly, you know, in their the work that they've done at working very closely with urban-based groups um, and. You know, I mean, there are numbers like, um, uh, you know, the numbers of um, uh, hectares of land that have been um, recognized now as being legally owned by peasant families in Brazil, for example. Uh, you know, so that there are those kinds of numbers. But the challenges are huge. I mean, and, and I, the, the major challenge being that, um, the, the, the level and extent of violence that is directed at um, peasant organizations who resist. I think that's a really quick follow-up question, which it, it seems like you're talking about different strategies and positioning for them. Have their strategies seemed mainly to be to engage with the global system, not, not necessarily more like guerrilla resistance or whatever? Has engagement been the main strategy? No. No, no. <laughs> Please, I hope that I hope that wasn't my message. No, no. Their message, their strategy from the start, was to disengage. For example, they never, ever, ever met and have not met uh, with uh, the WTO. They will only engage uh, with the powerful forces when um, when the movement has gained enough power and know that they have some kind of influence. Uh, and so with the World Trade Organization, that's never going to happen. Uh, so they, they remain outside. They don't engage in negotiation. Uh, on the other hand, with the FAO, they do uh, sit at the table because the FAO actually has given them a certain space. Okay? Um, uh, the World Bank, they will, they will not sit at, at the table with uh, the World Bank. Uh, and you know, they've been invited to, but the, the, in fact, I can just quickly tell you about the, I remember a number of years ago, the World Bank sent them an invitation to meet in, in uh, Washington. And the Via Campesina said, okay, well, well, we'll come to the meeting if you include on the agenda genuine, the need for genuine agrarian reform. And the World Bank said, nope, that's not on the agenda. And the Via Campesina said, well, we're not coming to the meeting then. You know, so they won't go, they won't engage when they know that their issues are not going to be given sp a space, you know, for, for some discussion. So, so that's why, and I think I mentioned that they, um, even when they are engaging with, you know, either a national government or an international institution, they will also continue to be uh, involved in direct action out in the streets, because without that, they'll, they'll lose their negotiations if they're not out on the street at the same time. Yeah, just playing off Danny's question a little bit, um, been trying to engage some of these ideas around the power of ideology. Um, some of my own 
more thinking more at a national level, and I found a lot of pushback from certain academics because you're not talking about kind of um, material power and a lot of change that can be quantified. It seems like people don't want to believe that there is power. So I'm curious um, how you feel like some of your ideas have been received in the academic community. Well, this, I mean, this book, the, this book, it's the only book um, on the Via Campesina. And um, I mean, there, there are articles uh, that have been written on it, but it's the only book so far on the Via Campesina. So it's been well received because it's the only one. <laughs> um, I, the, the, you know, it's, it's been, um, the, the one critique that people have made is that I did not uh, criticize the movement enough. Uh, and you know they, they ask you why? Well, why did you do that? Well, you know, <laughs> it's complex. It's complicated. I mean, if you're part of a movement, and I'm part of the movement, I was a farmer. I, you know, I was, I was, I was their technical support. I'm part of this movement. Um, you know, as a participant of a movement, you are obligated actually to criticize the movement. I mean, that's how you always improve the movement, right? But you keep those discussions usually internal to the movement because why would you want to you know show everybody your dirty laundry I mean you you know you're careful you're strategic about what it is that you put out there uh, for, for public uh, consideration um, so so it's been it's been very well received I mean I, I will and that's why I'm going to continue to do work um, mostly now on the solution that they're proposing because what, what the Via Campesina wants is concrete case studies of how this is working. I mean, is, is food sovereignty actually helping you know, to improve the well-being of communities? And if so, how? We, they want numbers. <laughs> you know? so, so no, I, 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 think, um, I think it's really important to uh, work on the, the stuff that isn't so clear. Um, that, that's the easy work. Numbers. <laughs> I mean, I just think if they're thinking about kind of neoliberalism and the whole economy, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of pushback about the potential power of ideas and mm -hmm. passion, right? And all the more reason why we need research on the power of ideas. <laughs> I mean, remember, I mean, the Via Campesina wouldn't, I mean, they, they dreamed this up. Yeah, and, and, and it makes total sense to me yeah. you present, you know, you, the end, you talk about the kind of conclusions and what you see as the most powerful outcomes, and yeah. most of this type of the points of idea. It's very powerful. Yeah. It's... Good question. Um, the, I mean, I, you know, I guess it's we need to recognize that um, 
people are, are at different stages in, in their struggles. Um, certainly the Viet Cong Sina experience tells us that. That, for example, you know, you'll have in some communities people who will not even be using the language of food sovereignty, but yet they're actually involved in a food sovereignty struggle. For example, uh, you know, when the Mexican um, peasant farmers are, when they succeed in not letting the drug cartels uh, force them to grow um, avocado uh, plants uh, because those are the, um, the cover crops for marijuana. Well, when the, when, the, when the peasants succeed in not allowing that to happen, you know, is that, you know, are they not involved in a, in a food sovereignty struggle? Um, you know, when, um, uh, when a, a, a Mexican peasant community succeeds in not allowing a Canadian mining company to set up business in their region, are they not involved in a, in a food sovereignty struggle? They might not be calling it that, but that's what they are doing. Because if we, if we think of you know, food sovereignty as controlling your own uh, production modes, your markets, your environments, your food cultures, then an awful lot of what you do actually is related to food in some way. Um, so, so I, I, you know, so that's those. There are those kinds of struggles that are just kind of, you know, emerging. And then you have the other kinds of struggles that, you know, for example, Via Campesina organizations have, you know, were, were engaging in food sovereignty even before the term came up. You know, even before they came up with the idea, the concept of food sovereignty, um, because what they were fighting for was access to land for fair prices, uh, for you know, the right to produce the, the kind of food that you want to produce and to produce it in your own territory uh, rather than importing food. Um, so I, I, I mean, I think that um, a lot of, the, now that the Via Campesina is working much more closely with urban-based uh, groups, uh, there, I, you know, I've seen some cases where the urban-based group will, will then start to shift more to working on food issues. Whereas before they might have just been Working on poverty issues, you know, inequality, uh, but now they they include a, a, a food discussion in that struggle. So I'm I'm not sure if I answered the question. Do do you want did you want to take it somewhere else or? Yeah, my point is like for example, uh, usually when we see the food crisis, yeah, uh, it's somewhere else. Ah. Yes. Is that the best of that mild economical crisis that we know that emerged from neoliberalism or capitalism? So, how we can convince those movements? Let's, let's, let's just for the sake of argument, occupy Wall Street. Uh -huh. How we can uh, formulate an alliance that, for those of you, with the food farmers, the movement that not south, 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 as you mentioned earlier, that how we can just become a new uh, frontier? For struggle, not only just for food, but also for all other means of life. But we know, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we all happy to hear the economy, but we don't know the consequences of that. We all happy to hear the production of uh, uh, emission and uh, atmosphere, but we don't know how that right. tied to other elements that we would struggle for and, 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 and create a wider platform for struggles that include youth, women. Marginalized communities uh, to push further for justice and equality within any system that we use. I mean, there, there is a lot of tools of support. Yeah, there is. Well, uh, you know, I, I was. I, I, I'll give you an example in Canada. Okay, um, we just had the uh, special rapporteur, the UN special rapporteur on the right to food. Um, um, engage in his very first mission to an OECD country, and that is Canada. And he, he's still there, actually. Uh, so he's you know spent he's spending about 10 days, 15 days, going across the country, meeting with all kinds of organizations to talk about you know how Canada is uh, realizing um, the right to food or not realizing the, the right to food. And to, in organizing for that mission. Um, we, you know, in Canada have really galvanized a social movement around food. Um, 
that that in, that encompasses all kinds of people that were not involved before, uh, and it was because you know it gave us that external kind of uh, um, what's the word impetus to to you know to start talking to each other in ways that we hadn't been talking uh, before. Um, so I, I think that that's what needs to happen, actually, that at the, lo at the national level, or at the local and national level, that you get that kind of interface uh, happening uh, among the various groups. Um, and then, you know, then it, it goes elsewhere after. But it seems to me that it's really important to really consolidate something, you know, in your own territory first. Um, but, but that's just because of the way that I, you know, the Vietnam Sin experience tells us that that's the way to organize. But that's, maybe, maybe it doesn't work here, I don't know, but, um, that, you know, that is the strategy that, that the Vietnam Sin uses. You, you gotta, you gotta consolidate yourself, you know, in your own territory first, because that's where things happen. You know, the production of food, the, the accumulation of capital, the, occurs in a particular place, and you've got to be organized in that particular place. And I'll just add to that, that there are a number of people at the university, particularly in the School of Environment and Natural Resources, and even the College of Food, Agriculture, and Environmental Sciences, who are in communication with, um, and Danny, you must be able to mention some of them, um, the, the people at Local Matters, the, the farmers market people, the consumer movements, where people are saying we don't want to consume milk that includes X, Y, and Z. We don't want to consume apples that have, um, what is it, some pesticide or something that is on it. And so there are many local movements. Another local movement is people in urban areas where there has been an exit of population from places like Detroit, who lost 50% of its population, mm -hmm. Cleveland, where people are taking over pieces of land and are demanding to be able to engage in urban agriculture. So we do have those kinds of movements. Perhaps what hasn't happened, or at least I don't know about it, if it has happened, are the growth in networking among those different organizations so that perhaps they can achieve the kind of political impact that an organization like La Via Campesina has, or they could be members of La Via Campesina. But another figure is the, the local food policy councils. Um, so many states have actually uh, passed legislation mm -hmm. that allow local food policy councils to have a say in policies that affect the production and distribution of food and the consumer's right to knowledge about the food that is on sale for them to consume. Right? Mm -hmm. So one thing I want to mention is, I know that some people have already left, but there's this which is on, was on your seat when you arrived. The Center for Latin American Studies receives funding through Title VI of the Department of Education. Some of that funding is what goes to support events and visitors um, like our speaker today. In order to provide a, a, an accounting to the Department of Education, the center needs information and feedback from you about the event. So if you would just take a minute to fill this out and just leave it on your seat, when you leave, then we can pick them up. And before you start filling it out, join me in thanking Professor Annette Neymara. Thank you very much.